Yes, we're almost there. Uh, welcome to a celebration of literature and living writers. My name is Megan Marshall. I'm the director of the PC Hyde Living Writers Series. And tonight is very special um, because our guest author, Lance Olson, about three years ago, almost to the day, was getting ready to come out here and read from his novel that had just come out at the time, My Red Heaven. And of course, as we know, what happened about three years ago to this day, the world shut down, right? The pandemic hit and we were forced to shelter in place and thus to uh, move Lance's event to Zoom. So uh, when we were in discussion about a time for him to finally come back out now that we are getting to whatever sense of normalcy that means wherever we are, we thought, you know, why not do it in March? A nice little retributive event. So we are so excited that we are celebrating him coming back and just all of the in-personness that we had taken for granted before that. Um, but before I welcome him up to the podium, I do want to thank those who have helped to make this series and this event possible, and that includes all of our friends at Love Library, Marco Tomlin, my fabulous co-host, also Don Yuka Hall, Laurel Bliss, and Rebecca Williamson. I also want to thank the Department of English and Comparative Literature for their continued support of the series, and also our friends from Aztec Shops, including Michael uh, Ramirez and our friends who are selling books over there in the corner. So books are available for purchase, FYI, if you want to check those out a little bit later. Um, and lastly, importantly, I'd like to acknowledge the space that we are privileged to share tonight. For millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been a part of this land. Land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations. And as members of the San Diego State University community, we acknowledge this legacy. All right, just a little reminder, if you haven't done so already, please turn off your cell phone, silence your cell phones. And um, this event is being recorded, but don't worry, all we see is there. So you're not gonna be a YouTube star tonight. Maybe tomorrow night. All right, without further ado, I am pleased to introduce our featured reader. Literary maverick Lance Olson is the author of more than 30 books of and about innovative writing, including most recently the novels Always Crashing in the Same Car, which was just released this year, which you will be sharing from tonight, Skin Elegies, which came out in 2021, and My Red Heaven, which came out in 2020. His short stories, essays, and reviews have appeared in hundreds of journals and anthologies, such as Conjunctions, Black Warrior Review, Our Very Own Fiction International, Village Voice, Bomb, McSweeney's, and Best American Non-Required Reading. A Guggenheim Berlin Prize, DAAD Artist in Berlin Residency, Rockefeller Center Bellagio Residency, NEA Fellowship, and Pushcart Prize recipient, as well as a Fulbright Scholar, if that weren't enough, uh, Olson teaches experimental narrative theory and practice at the University of Utah. I first met Lance in 2012 when he came uh, to share from his recent novel at that time, which was called Calendar of Regrets. Um, I was instantly enamored with the text and uh, compelled by a particular quote. And now I always like to share with my students the dictum of good writers borrow, great writers steal. So I have stolen this quote and used it countless times since, uh, mostly, you know, because I feel like it makes me sound cool and literary. So sorry, not sorry. Uh, but the quote is as follows. Look closely. Everything is webbed with everything. Existence and illuminated manuscript you walk through. I lifted this quote because it so aptly and artfully described the immersive powers of literature as well as what bibliophiles have known all along. Our lives are but a series of overlapping narratives, comedies, tragedies, dramas, and now digital echoes, 140 characters or less or more. The reading of Olson's work asks us to look closely, to observe and question. His latest novel, Always Crashing in the Same Car, examines the illuminated web that was the life and art of David Bowie but offers much more than a shiny holograph of the iconoclastic artist. Instead, it mosaics questions of how we read others, how we are read by them, how we process notions of pastness, and how we cope in the face of the ultimate or literal pastness, death. Lance's ability to weave threads of narrative so seamlessly keeps me returning to his work over and over again. 
It reminds me that I am at least one gossamer filament in the web and that we are all vivid images in the vast manuscript. Perhaps this is just one of the reasons why the American Book Review lauds Olson as being among the finest writers of social critique and speculative fiction today. So if the Living Writers series had a Hall of Fame, uh, this would definitely be your induction ceremony. So please join me in welcoming Lance Olson to the Hall of Fame. Wow, that was awesome. Okay, that was totally awesome. Um, Megan and I go back like a really long time. Isn't that like sobering? <laughs> totally sobering. Thank you so much. Thanks for being on the journey. Um, thanks everybody for coming tonight. And then, you know, we should just chant Bowie's name for a little bit. Um, it's so, well, I somebody just asked me for, for this interview when I first got involved with Bowie and what, what was the impetus for this book. And it was like the day I turned 13. So it's been a long time growing, but, but it's, it's there. Um, so what I'm going to do is just talk real briefly about the book, though Megan really actually, you know, contextualized it really, really well, and then read um, maybe three passages from it, and um, then we will open things up to questions, I guess, in, in the classroom, right? Um, so I, I love the idea that this book was published actually on Valentine's Day last month. It's a kind of love song, very complex and conflicted love song that I have with Bowie. Um, but also it's it's a love song to not knowing. Um, this this idea that the more we actually go into a subject, the more we learn what we don't know about the subject. Um, and Bowie is like the poster boy um, for the idea of not knowing. He, he is the great black box personality. Um, it's really hard to know where his sort of acting Bowie, performing Bowie gives over to something else. If it gives over to something else, I think that's that's really interesting. The novel sweeps back and forth over time um, throughout his whole life, but it really focuses on those last couple of months when he was battling liver cancer, though he didn't let anybody know about it, and then get this, his sixth heart attack. Um, so, and he like literally, he would go into the studio and he would still like, outperform, out, out energize um, the musicians he was working with. And they would all be like, we hate you, David Bowie. And it would be like, and he had liver cancer and, and a six heart attack he was battling. This, this is just so amazing to me. Um, it takes the form as, as some of you already know of a kind of collage, what I love about collage is collage, the structure of collage um, uh, you know, works in different voices, which is to say different perspectives, which is to say um, that it turns any kind of what would you call a transcendental truth into a problem rather than into a solution. Um, and so uh, I, I tell the story from Bowie's perspective, sometimes a, a, usually an older Bowie, um, a musicologist who's trying to write uh, a monograph about them, lovers, uh, friends, um, so all, all sorts of people and all sorts of voices and all sorts of perspectives um, um, on him. And, and as Megan said, it's really at its deepest level, and, and maybe the first passage will um, underscore this, it's about reading. Um, it, it's really, you know, the world, Jacques Derrida has this, this line, there's nothing outside the text implying that the world itself is a kind of text that we're always reading, which is absolutely true. And, and how we read, from what perspective we read, um, how open we are to reading through other people's imaginations and other people's um, uh, viewpoints, um, which is to say empathize, um, is really interesting to me. I mean, it's, if, if one thinks of um, being in the world as an act of reading, uh, I think one, one becomes richer and also becomes aware that one is always being read, uh, right? And so how are we read? How are we always misread? Um, and then, you know, all of those things um, kind of get complicated with notions of pastness. Um, how do we retell yesterday um, in, in meaningful ways, in rich ways, in resonant ways? Um, what, what is our access to truth recovery? Uh, and when you get to Bowie, so I, I started, you know, first of all, I turned 13, then, then there were some years that went by. And then um, I started to get into the research 
of the novel. And I, so the first thing I did was to read all of the biographies. It was stunning. There were like six biographies and six David Bowies. Um, it was, it was, you know, it really was. I mean, you just fell into these completely different David Bowies. And I began to realize that, you know, biography is almost never biography. It's always like a subset of spiritual autobiography about the person who wrote it. Um, and so, it, so each of them was like really what Bowie meant to that person or this person or, or some other person, which leads me to something that I know you guys talked about in your class, which is um, Mikhail Bakhtin, he's a, a theorist's notion of unfinalizability. Bakhtin talks about how when we first meet people or when we first read, you know, meet a text, um, we try to finalize those things. We try to categorize them. We try to essentially shut them down because shutting them down is a way that we can gain a sense of understanding of them. And Bakhtin then goes on. By the way, Bakhtin is known for other things. This happens in one little paragraph in one little book that he wrote, but it's the only part that was interesting about Bakhtin. But that's a whole other thing. Um, but that the more we actually come to know somebody, the more we realize they're unfinalizable, um, that they're only finalizable at the moment of their death. And then they actually become least finalizable because they enter narrative. And as soon as you enter narrative, you know, there, there it goes. And, and it's the same thing with books, right? We read a book to try to stabilize it. You know, they, one can even argue that, that the act of, of literary criticism is an act to stabilize a text. But in fact, texts refuse to be stabilized. That's why we keep coming back to them over and over and over again, right? That's why you love books. Um, so with, without further ado, I think I'll start with the passage at the beginning of the novel. So if you're not familiar with the novel, this is how it starts. Um, but also it will very quickly drift into a kind of meditation on Bowie's part about the act of reading. And for those of you who, who don't know the novel um, or don't know Bowie, here's something that blew me away. Bowie didn't like to fly. And so, you know, except like across oceans and stuff like that, but he, he was just terribly scared that he was going to crash. So he tended to take trains. So what he did was to have made for him two huge steamer trunks and he filled them with different books each time he traveled. So he had 1500 books with him anywhere he went. Um, he also found it was a good way to kick his cocaine addiction. Um, so um, when he was shooting the man who fell to earth, he back in the day would have shot a scene, gone in and, and like gotten like monstrously high. And instead he shot a scene, went in and read a book. Um, you should be taking notes on that. Um, and, and, um, but what was wonderful was he was, he was an autodidact. He taught himself all sorts of stuff. You get access to his reading list, which I, I was able to do. And it is mind boggling how well read he is, how widely read he is. Um, you know, he's he's reading like Heraclitus over here, Nietzsche over here, history of rock and roll over there, Don DeLillo over there. It was it was truly an extraordinary um, thing. So if it sounds like he's overeducated, he is. Um, so humming something that came to him in red dreams, he considers mid-shave this man suddenly in his 60s, this man who looks 15 younger, uh, years younger than he is, he considers mid-shave the anomaly situated on his jawline just in front of his right earlobe. How he never noticed it before he took this breath this morning, not even six o'clock yet, his wife asleep a little longer, quick white spring light after last night's rain rushing every surface in the bathroom. How time has unexpectedly and irreversibly arisen in that tiny corner of him when he wasn't being anyone. The blue-green smudge, the deviation, no larger than a 5.0 in Baskerville typeface. He considers it, and somewhere inside the next breath forgets it, this burl of self-awareness unsettling into eagerness for his first cup of coffee, his first cigarette of three or four packs today, the pleasant understated shocks of them. The book he will slip into by the incandescent wall of living room windows, all the silences he will find in it, all the noise. 
the sound of a truck at 50 miles per hour, the man is reading, stretched out on the cream colored leather couch in that shun, uh, sunshine squall, having remembered as he moved toward it, coffee cup in hand, the daily letdown, he no longer smokes. He hasn't smoked for years, not since. How can his body forget something like that? An almost perfectly square black first edition of John Cage's first volume, a collection of lectures and essays published when he was already 49, still not quite John Cage, in 1961, Wesleyan University Press, Mint Condition, which the man stumbled across yesterday, browsing the rat's nest of stacks at the Strand. No ambition except to see where the shelves led him after lunch. His favorite, a bagged chicken sandwich with watercress and tomatoes from Olives on Prince Street, eaten on a bench in Washington Square, listening to dogs and squirrels squabbling, kids skateboarding, someone playing jazz, unimprovised Keith Jarrett on an upright piano the pianist wheeled in from somewhere all the way to the fountain. He first read this book, when did he first read it? The early 70s, he would guess, though he can't recall with any certainty. The only way the man knows for sure he read it is because he read about himself reading it in a biography about him. He reads every one of them, even his exes, even Angie's, his little darling blowtorch, ever fascinated, ever puzzled, about how others write him into themselves. At the time, Ziggy Stardust had abridged his diet to the elemental, cocaine, milk, red peppers, and Angie's rage. At the time, Ziggy Stardust, the bisexual alien rock star who attained fame only as Earth unraveled into its final five years, couldn't tell anyone anymore who Ziggy Stardust really was, because he was no longer anything except this burst of coked up energy and anxiety and immortality. And next, he had to get out of Britain. He had to get out of Los Angeles. He had to reach grimy gray walls in Berlin to slip the habit and slip Angie and reawaken his music within Brian Eno's gravitational vehemences. Given four phonographs, the man reads, we can compose and perform a quartet for explosive motor, wind, heartbeat, and landslide. Now, did he ever encounter that line before? Once upon a time, Cage's words reconfigured him, yet he can't remember any of them, not with anything like specificity. They lived inside him for more than a quarter century, operating softly, unremittingly, and nowhere except on the page in front of him now for the first time. You read a book with this belief that you will never leave it behind, yet 20 pages in, you can't summon a single detail from page three. The event begins dissolving as if on some kind of dimmer switch, one month, two years, and if you're lucky, you're still, uh, still sustaining a gauzy set of emotions about it, a couple of out of focus images, maybe a loose idea, this rattling tin box of character traits. If you're lucky, if you're not, maybe it's only a half recollected title swelling out of the addle, an author's name, this spreading unease in the face of what books actually are all about at the end of the day. Memories, fiasco. Lying on the couch, it comes to him that if every cell composing a person resurrects every seven or 10 years, then this man in his late 60s, listening to the sounds of his wife stirring into her day in the kitchen has been an absolute somebody else at least three times since first reading the lines, he can't be 100% convinced he has ever read, yet can, and yet can't. Um, 
that's the thing they never tell you about in literature classes. Uh, the, I, I mean, isn't it amazing to think about the idea of how many books you've forgotten as well as how many you've remembered um, and how many, how many sort of, how do you say it's sort of misremembered? Um, I, like there are whole scenes that I've read that I swear are in there and somebody erased them after I read them. Um, so what I want to do next is go, and, and you can tell from what I'm reading, right, that um, I'm really interested in the Bowie I mean, I'm interested in all the Bowie, but I'm really interested in the Bowie who in the 90s went into this yeah kind of band called Ten Machine to kind of reinvent himself and then sort of faded out. And then in the early 2000s came in a completely different person um, who was trying to think about what it felt like being a musician late in life. Um, and that there weren't models, right? There's a model of a rock musician who stays the rock musician. So think of Rolling Stones, who are basically the same people and they can play the same songs late in life. And then there are other ones like Bowie, who had to like invent what it was like to be somebody who is no longer young and still doing musical innovation. That intrigues me. Um, okay, so let me get some, some water and then we shall begin. Um, so... What you need to know about this passage is Bowie um, has now been diagnosed with liver cancer and has gone on chemo and has decided after about six months or so to forego chemo um, because it, it, his doctors had told him, you know, it's, the cancer is already metastasized. Um, it's simply a matter now of time and it's how you want to spend that time. And he finally goes, screw it. I just want to be feel as well as I can for as long as I can. And Bowie being Bowie, this is also so cool about him. He's a hero. Um, he worked until two days before he died um, and uh, worked on his last album. Um, so that's, that's also very cool. Anyway, <clears throat> so and we're back in New York. That first section, he was thinking of himself in Washington Square and some places in New York. Um, he had a... <laughs> Lovely little penthouse is um, <laughs> on Lafayette that cost $15 million. Um, it, it is a little easier to be um, an innovative musician after your first 10 million, I hear. Um, okay. Urban dust, wet chill, diesel fumes on the tongue. A narrow New York street, rush hour disturbances pressing in, condensing around you. And it is the man in his sandy brown cashmere overcoat, heading south on foot, crossing prints, past the five-story mural for Gucci painted across one full side of an apartment building, the bright cherry garage doors of the fire station, the tenement overrun with parakeet green fire escapes, the sensation influx, the first time in months he has felt well enough to tackle a walk like this, Leaning against the wall beneath one of the Corinthian columns outside the Duane Reed at the corner of Lafayette and Spring, a homeless guy in a blimpish navy blue parka asks him what day it is. The man stops, reflects. Wednesday, he says, it's Wednesday. So how do you know, the homeless guy asks. His head is pulled up over, uh, sorry, his hood is pulled up over his head. And despite the atrophying day, he has on dark sunglasses. The only things the man can distinguish about his face are an outburst of glistening charcoal beard and patches of rosacea. The man reaches into his pockets for a few dollars. The homeless guy waves him off. I'm not married, he says. I, I don't have a daughter. You don't have to worry. Where, uh, worry. where are you from, bro? England. I live here now. Everyone lives here now. What about the rest of your life? What do you mean? Your name, what's your name? Davy. How do you know? I mean, it's almost Christmas, right? Spam has become especially problematic of late. That's why I teach. That's why the helicopter. You know how come 9-11 happened? What do you teach, the man asks, taking a place beside him, leaning against the wall beneath the column. He slips his hands into his coat pockets for warmth. For a while, they both attend the pedestrians hurrying past. The eyes, the homeless guy says, the teeth, advanced seminars. 
Five feet in front of them, a 20-something woman in a cumbersome doll dress apparently made out of tinfoil meets her 20-something boyfriend in salmon pink skinny jeans down to his ankle, yellow socks, olive beanies. Do I look like a fancy lampshade, she asks him. They air kiss and move on, keeping a distance that suggests they're strangers. Walking ashes, the homeless guy says after them, observing the couple blend back into the crowd. Davy isn't much of a name, is it? I'm Josh. I know what the voice box is used for, hot and cold air conditioning. That's why I teach. The vocal cords are always used straightforward, which brings us back to 9-11. Tell me, 9-11 happened so more philosophers could be created. An important nexus in the space, time, and so forth. Go force, um, no, uh, snow fort, gods, uh, sorry. <laughs> Let me try it again. Uh, go forth, no force, snow fort, God, uh, Christ is God's selfie. Let me put it another way. You have two girls for, call them sons, call them nomadic girls. I didn't know we weren't allowed to love here. If I'd known that, everything would be blue jay. Where do you sleep, Josh? First quantum insurrection on the left. Hey, where the fuck did Monday and Tuesday go? Seriously, man, I mean, you have two girls, four. I got no enemies. Does the feeling of remorse redeem us? That was the patrol. This is the war. That's the takeaway. That's the takeaway. I have an idea, the man says. Can I pick us up a couple sandwiches across the street? I've got a bit of an appetite. What is it? What sort of blueprint? That's the critical, the analytical, the zoophytical. Religion is a verb from the Latin, as you may recall, meaning to wear glasses or spectacles. Love is from the Greek, meaning to howl or bay. So you have five rams, you have seven. It's up to the clocks, really, if that's the way you want to put it. I was driving my dad's car. This was a long time ago. What was he like? your dad. Well, every policeman is a dentist. You can't give everything away. So you have five rams, you have seven. It's up to you. You can't give everything away. It doesn't matter to me. Do you think I can go to England now? Why? To see the Americans. I'd like to see some Americans. That's where they all live. Sometimes two, sometimes four. There's a man who buys a suit, buys a hat. You following me? He understands, except for the parts he doesn't. That's you, Davey. You have time to answer one more question for me? Yeah. This isn't going to stop, is it? Can you wait for me here, Josh? I'll pick up those sandwiches and be right back. That's a Jehovah's Witness, yes. Tell me something. Before you go, do you have any physical evidence for it? For what? Today being Wednesday, today being Wednesday, this troubles me, this troubles the crap out of me because at least one molecule of H2O out of every glass of water you ever drank once passed through a dinosaur, boom! Isn't that the pediatrics, the theatrics beyond the orthopedics? At certain income levels, as you may recall, death is unimaginable. From the Sanskrit for Amazon devices, do you know the incredible string band? The 5,000 spirits of the layers of the onion? I do. All life must turn to me. Everybody's ever fucked, every she, every he, every whatever, just sleazy little tremors in the reptilian complex now, aren't they? These barely discernible lurches in heart rate and body temperature, am I right? I don't have a hammer, not for these scapulae. That's the takeaway. Everybody has to survive, bro, until they don't. A bike courier, white skeletal helmet, lime green shirt, tan canvas messenger bag slung over one shoulder, skims up onto the sidewalk, ricochets among pedestrians, scuds back into the street. Walking ashes, Josh says, observing. You got teeth, don't you? Yeah, they're mine. You can borrow them. I'm corralled with that. Would you like something to drink too? Two girls for, so maybe a Coke. Where's the love? It was here a vortex ago. Like God saith in Lamentations 322, don't make me come down there, you dumb fucks. You're my friend. I like you, dude. That's the patrol. This is the war. I like you too. How long have you been living out here, Josh? 900 years, but it only feels like 800. Things come, things go, then they go again, like family and paper clips. Only I don't know what a clock is. That's Jeremiah 29, 11. So there's this woman on the outside looking in. Fat, you think she sees me or is she merely fixing her reflection's hair? Hard to say, the man says, patting Josh on the knee. You wait here, okay? I'll be right back. The man pushes off the wall and steps to the curb, Josh's voice merging with motors and murmurations behind him. Aren't we all just trusting that somebody kept count since the first Wednesday arrived? When you die, you become science. When you die, you become science.
Okay. So then there's this other part. And it's one of the things that's so wonderful about writing um, fiction is that you get to inhabit minds that aren't yours. And, and that I think is like the real, so the real question to ask yourself is why you really write fiction. And I hope that the answer, at least in part, is to feel what other people are feeling and thinking and how they think and why they think, as opposed to just always think about what you think and feel. Um, because then why are you writing? That's just me. Um, so now the only thing we need to know about this section is how many people have seen The Man Who Fell to Earth? Has anybody seen this? Okay, we got a couple, we got a couple. So The Man Who Fell to Earth um, stars David Bowie as the man who fell to earth. He comes from a different planet. and. Um, I, I won't tell you a whole bunch about the plot, but but a sort of um, sequel was made to that in musical form uh, just before Bowie died. And all you need to know about this is this is opening night um, in 2015, December 7. So it has just over a month left to live. And um, it's called Lazarus and I'm, I'm just trying to think about anything else I need to tell you. Oh, and then there's this clip that's shown on the news. And you actually can find this on YouTube if you want to. And it's a clip that's shown on the news of Bowie arriving on opening night. It's about 15 seconds long. And it's him moving through the crowd with his bodyguards accompanied by Amon um, into the theater. And what's really interesting is just slowing it down a little bit and starting to look at it. And you can actually see Bowie starting not to be there. Um, it's a really, really haunting 15-second uh, clip. And so th it, this starts with that. So the nightly news shows a glossy black SUV pulling up to the New York Theater Workshop for the musical's opening. The predictable herding, the hoots, the raised cell phones, the camera flashes, a glitter of insults. The door swings open and the bodyguards spill out around the couple, a man leading the way, the man trailing six or seven steps behind. The nightly news shows the man's gray hair having overtaken his sandy brown, cut close like an accountant's, stubble in sides, the antithesis of anyone's idea of stylish. Now, notice for a moment all the same how much the nightly news misses. It neglects to show by way of illustration the rubble that the man's immune system has become. It neglects to point out the 34 days left inside him. Only 15 seconds long, the footage of his arrival at the New York theater workshop moves too fast to follow in any detail. You have to slow it down blow up each instant on your screen before you can begin to see what's really going on. Look, there, how forced the man's smile is. Closer, how his teeth protrude negligibly as his sick gums recede. He isn't wearing makeup any longer. His pasty skin appears almost translucent in patches. Now, Look at the pallid green vein near his left temple, the age spots on his left cheek. Look at his neck. Remark how slender it has become. Look at his ears. Remark how large they have grown. See his skinny legs, his wide feminine hips, how he carries his head inappreciably forward this evening, how his gait is off a scarcely noticeable lumber having invaded it. Who is he? Who is this man? This is the man moving across a brief stretch of opening night, yet for him that brief stretch is boundless and radiant with adoration, fascination, those flashes, that continuous cell phone scintillation. And what is the man thinking? He is thinking every step is a battle. Observe how he avoids meeting the eyes of his fans, how he bores down on the entrance to the theater, closing the gap between him and it as quickly as possible. 
And what is the saddest sight in these 15 seconds? There how painstakingly he clutches a small bottle of water to his stomach with both hands, like it might slip out of his grip and into another reality if he isn't careful as the bodyguards barrel him through the covey of onlookers. Many fewer than he may have expected, not hundreds, not scores, but playing the footage over and over, you count at most 30. Why does this man move like that? This man moves like that because he is beelining backstage, shedding his environment as he goes. What does this man want more than anything when he gets there? To collapse into a chair, any chair, sapped, shot, exhausted by this hundred foot slog. He wants a few minutes to collect himself before the curtains go up and he is required to appear interested in others again shrug on his David Bowie, that suit of lead. In light of this, look at the footage once more. Take your time. Look at those fitful seconds decelerated, enlarged. Now, who is he? Who is this man? What can you determine he is not forgetting repeatedly? You can determine he is not forgetting repeatedly that the future will fail to include him. He is imagining every territory he will not inhabit, all the people, the books, the crucial objects that will burn to the ground. What else does the nightly news omit? The nightly news omits what occurs when our plots slow down, when those mechanisms that drive them, combat, acclaim, evasion, promise, pain, lose their urgency their scope diffuse into the lives we all in truth occupy if steadily less and less. The nightly news does not show that the only thing separating one human being from another is ruthlessly the architecture of the body. And how Amon, upon their return home from the opening that Monday evening, will need to help her husband undress help him urinate, help wipe up the spatters on the floor around the toilet. The nightly news does not describe how touching the man's skin feels to his wife. Is it warm, cool, soft, parched, busy with too many reminders, nor what runs through her thoughts as she does so. The nightly news does not record or what crosses her mind when she kisses him goodnight and recalls that nowadays he tastes of decay. The nightly news does not describe the scent of the couple's sheets, the firmness of their mattress, whether tonight the man will sleep there or out of kindness for her, out of an appreciation for his wife's need for a hush among the pillows and quilts on the mattress in the panic room, listening to the high pitched whine of his own nerves firing. It does not show the dream the man will chance upon with the help of a sedative. Both his lungs all at once beginning to glow in his chest, through his ribs and flesh, blurry balls of light as he stands by the window, and how that light swiftly expands to engulf him, and then the living room, and then the city, and then the universe what the man will make of that dream when it wakes him inside the hour of the wolf. How lying there, mulling it over, the man will hope one day to understand it. The nightly news does not show what he feels as these reflections traverse his synapses at 270 miles per hour. What is the man experiencing? And what is he experiencing now? And now, thank you. We need another round of applause for Lance. <laughs> and one for Bowie, and one for Bowie. I'm sure Bowie's spirit is inhabiting the room right now. 
Um, always crashing in the same car and my red heaven are available for purchase. If you want to grab a copy, I'm sure Lance will be happy to sign it. And then in about 10 minutes or so, we're going to be over across the hallway in room 408. If anybody wants to join us for a Q&A, thank you all so much for joining us and have a restful spring break. Yeah.